Before we jump into the discussion, we'd love to start first with a little bit more about your stories, a little bit about your biography and, and what's led you to the work that you do now. Wow, 1969, hot summer, July night, uh, <laughs> trying to break the hind go seek record, top of an old oak tree, because everyone's looking east and west, no one's thinking to look north. My brother Steve is looking south, because he always thinks I climbed out from under a rock, but still, nobody was, so I had it. I had the stars talking to the man on the moon. Suddenly I hear this voice calling my name, thinking that it's destiny, only to find out it's my dad telling me to come inside pointing to a really grainy image on that rabbit-eared TV, you know, and I knew it had to be important because he didn't make me go behind and, like, navigate the antenna rabbit ears, so I got to actually watch it. <laughs> and he just pointed silently, and then he said, human walking on the moon, man walking on the moon for the very first time. And immediately I ran outside because I looked at the moon. I was just talking to, you know, this person and I didn't see anything. And I thought I had missed it and ran back out inside. And he was still on TV. I was like, great, ran back outside. And, you know, did, what did I see? Nothing. And after about two hours, I never saw anything. So we're not going to go there. Okay, don't ask, well, what did you? No, no, you don't see it. It's too far away. But what I did see in my own mind's eye was the image of my footprint on the moon, of being able to one day look back on Earth and have that view of some little girl crazily running back and forth. And that's the view that I wanted. My, wing, my, my, my dreams took wings, and I haven't looked back since. It's awesome. Oh, yeah, I'm supposed to say, all right, so my mind is, all right, so then fast forward. A new graduate in biochemistry at San Francisco State University, go Gators. Um, University of Washington School of Medicine, go Huskies, on an Air Force scholarship. Um, 15 years into yanking and banking in a wide variety of aircraft, F-111s, 15s, 16s, 18s, helicopters, heavies, air-to-air -air refuelers, medevacs, anything going to altitude, wanted to be in it. So, All right, wow. Uh, like, wow. She's flying wow. these planes, y'all. She's <laughs> flying these planes. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't seem to go quite fast enough or quite high enough, and at that time, the space shuttle was the only way to take it higher and faster. So I went for that, and um, I've just been like... A, Yanking and banking ever since. Retired after 22 years as an Air Force uh, Colonel, senior flight surgeon. And the best part of all is I'm here with you today. Pass the <laughs> mic. <laughs> Woo! When I, when I was in school, in middle school, uh, they made science fair mandatory in our school. And one of the things that's always a challenge is, you know, when we do science and math, it's more we have to learn like from a book, the history of it, rather than do it, rather than do discovery. It's sort of like going into PE class and someone would say, okay, we're doing uh, baseball today. Sit down, open your books, <laughs> right? And so we were really lucky because we had science fair. And at the time, uh, we had a huge energy crisis in the country and uh, Jimmy Carter was putting solar panels on the White House and I got interested in what became kind of more mechanical engineering and energy and green energy things. And so I ended up doing projects uh, first, kind of creating a solar house, and you know, we didn't have the internet, so I went downtown to, <laughs> to get the larger number of books uh, and started looking at that. And the key insight, that kind of thing that you had is, I got that kind of confidence that I could do this, wow. right? I could make a new thing. So I, the first thing I did was a solar house. The next year, um, I made the collector work. And the next year, we did windmills um, and phase chain storage and all kinds of different things all throughout high school. So I was, I was that kid. Um, <laughs> And uh, it was amazing to see that. And it's interesting. It's so exciting because I just gave a talk in Toronto. I'm from Buffalo. So I don't know why the solar-powered kid was uh, up in <laughs> Buffalo, New York, where there's a lot of snow. But, um, but Ontario has just gotten rid of coal. Well, that's incredible. You know, and so I grew up on that border and where Tesla lit Buffalo, you know, with AC. And so what could have been and all the green energy that could have been, but they're, we're getting there. So it's exciting. I want to, since we're talking about middle school, just honor these lovely young ladies. And they're so Woo. far over there. Uh, if you, yeah, you want to come them, yeah. closer, yeah. come closer so Dr. Cagle can see you. Again. Yes, come, ladies. Yeah. Come on over. You're the come on over. Let's go. Yeah. Come on. Yeah, I love that. I'm glad you did that. I was like, yeah. Come on closer, ladies. Exactly. And while we're doing that, by the way, Megan, a uh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that the thing that happens is a lot of times you don't know you're doing something you're interested in. I was lucky because I ended up doing a, someone handed me a paper. It was about solar energy and energy engineering, and it was at the University of Colorado, and you could apply uh, to go there with a scholarship. And so I went out to Boulder in the summer. 
And I found out that was engineering. It was civil and mechanical and these kinds. So that's the school. I decided to apply to those schools. Uh, but I think it's, it's you know, for people making sure we're tracking and including people that we're doing this kind of work in every high school, in every middle school, in every kindergarten. So people are learning design thinking and computational thinking. And I was lucky to do that. I ended up going to MIT to mechanical engineering. And unfortunately, uh, as Reagan came into power, the Saudis dropped the oil price and we got away from solving green energy. So a lot of us who were headed that way, there just really weren't jobs and there wasn't money. In fact, a friend of mine, Ellie Sachs, um, ended up not doing solar, but he ended up inventing the 3D printer. So we went in different <laughs> directions. Uh, uh, but I ended up in, in IT and tech and much more in this place called the Media Lab, which is a magical lab that was very, there's a new video up on 60 Minutes about it. It's sort of the beginning of the internet kind of lab. And so that's how I ended up much more in the internet. And out here in Silicon Valley, I went to Japan and worked for Apple Computer, uh, which was really fun. And then I came to Silicon Valley. And we worked on uh, the beginning of smartphones. And so they were this big. And no one knew what we were talking about. But um, sometimes you have to do something. And then maybe that particular company, it, it, it didn't work. And it went out of business. But then three companies later, my colleagues, so I sat with a guy named Andy Rubin, who is Andy Droid Android, and Tony Fidel, who did the iPod with Steve Jobs, it is the iPhone. So 98% of the cell phones on the planet came from people's ideas and work from this company three companies ago, right? Pierre created eBay. We worked, so sometimes it's like, in a, think about apprentice journey mastery. And so the work that, you know, when I was your guys' age is uh, in the middle schoolers, and then later, other people, and you too, it's sort of practice makes permanent, yeah. which is the key takeaway, I think, in this stuff. And so getting to do it and just try and find people, and it's the key. Love and then it. you went to Google, and then you went to the White House? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I went to Google. Um, actually, in between that, I ran an internet company in the beginning of the web for the LGBTQ community called Planet Out. Uh, we raised about $30 million and built this really cool company um, uh, that, uh, that was doing sort of new media like others and community. And then I went to Google after that. And we, I was a, there were about uh, just over 1,000 people when I got there. And so you know, it was an amazing thing. Sort of you're flying the plane and building the plane. And so I, I led New Business Development, which was the team that helped all the engineers with the business deals and partnerships at the very beginning of product. So you'd have to call the publishers and say, hey, can we scan all the books in the world or in the beginning of Android or YouTube? So it was a really entrepreneurial team, and it was fun and did some other things there. That's powerful to hear both of your stories. Thank you for sharing. Um, we'd love to kind of talk in the context of talking about hidden figures grounded in who are some of your favorite hidden figures? Wow. Um, well, all the hidden figures are my my favorite, and uh, you don't know them because they're hidden. No, you actually you do know them. Um, but one of my all-time favorites, of course, is Dr. Katherine Johnson. Um, but uh, on her shoulders, or or vice versa, is also Dorothy Heights, Ida B. Wells, Barbara Jordan, um, Mae Jameson. I can give you a roll call that just goes on and on and on. But and Mae was the first black woman in space. Right? Absolutely. Yep. It's a great list. It's incredible, and we we'll, we just gave uh, Kat a, a thing that we worked together um, when we had the White House screening of Hidden Figures, and so uh, there you go. <laughs> so uh, we got to host the amazing cast and and young people at that time and others, and uh, so it was great to talk to everybody. Um, you know, sort of the the three characters, the three people depicted there. But one of the things we were just talking about backstage was. Uh, this video that Catherine had made in some of your conversations with Catherine. And I, I think, say a little bit about some of the things she talked about. And I'll, I'll say a little bit about this one video riff that's in there that I hope you guys will go get. Oh, wow. Well, uh, Catherine's wonderful. Um, you know, I talked to her almost, uh, there are times it's almost on a weekly basis. And it's, it's great. She says, you know, I'm, I'm Those 99. Are goals, by the way. <laughs> Those, Those are goals. <laughs> She said, I'm 99 years old, and, and, and they don't realize that I still have so much to say, and I want someone to talk to me. And I learned so much from her. She has so much to teach. And so uh, I've gotten tremendous pearls from her. But some of my favorites have to be, uh, for the movie itself, one of the things that I wanted to know, and I feel so privileged to be able to sit at her feet and, and ask these questions, was how did she finally come up with that calculation? How did she know that that was the answer? And she said, well, it, it was 
pretty straightforward. She said, we were error checkers. So we did the math, we did the work that the men didn't have time to do, and she's always <coughs> giving credit uh, to others. And she said, that was our job, and we did it well, and we did it to the best of our abilities. So we were experts in error. We were experts in a sense, uh, you know, kind of um, uh, adding to what she was saying, we were experts in, in failure. Yeah. They had to fix and correct it. So she said, I simply just kept error checking all these options or possibilities until there, was, there were no more errors, that they were all canceled out, corrected out. And the only thing left was the answer, was the solution. And that, I just thought that was quite amazing. One of the things that uh, our uh, good friend Dylan McGee has a series called Makers, which hopefully some people have seen some, go to makers.com. It's the largest collection of stories of women. Uh, and so when we discovered Catherine, when I came across her story, I'm like, Dylan, get your camera, run. She's 97 or 96 at the time. And so there's an amazing film of Catherine in her own words telling the story. Uh, and there's a moment when uh, she's looking at the camera and she has explained how they calculate the trajectories. And she says she has a little bit of a draw. We were really worried when they were coming off the moon. <laughs> and it cuts to Neil Armstrong. And she, she looks at him and she, she, look, she says, because uh, I was hoping he had it right. And then she looks at the camera and she says, I was hoping I had it right too. <laughs> you know? And it's just, to me, these stories, we didn't know these stories. And to hear how it felt, uh, how, not only the incredible elite level of mathematics that they were doing and their approach, but also how it felt in the true story of hearing them. You know, I, I, we were talking about how Catherine's like, and we said the moon would be here. Like she's holding her hands, like she can feel she's in her not, near late 90s, and she can still feel how what that what the system she was had calculated felt like. It's almost physical to her. Wow. Isn't that incredible? And if you've ever seen the calculation, it's so detailed that it would take any professor at least 15, 20 minutes, a better part of an hour, to explain and describe. And to see her do it on an interview in a matter of minutes and be so um, precise and artistic about it, visual, you feel like you're right there. It's really pretty incredible. Another one from that, this particular time that I think is, you know, the, the early missions, the early times, there's, there's two hidden figures uh, that might be interesting to mention from the early kind of Mercury, Apollo, Gemini kind of time. One is a woman named um, Margaret Hamilton, who, uh, and she's a Lego now, so you see this stack of books next to her in the Lego, and so she's standing all the way next to all of the code that she led or wrote for all the Apollo command modules, the lunar lander and Skylab. And one of the key stories in that that we found, uh, she, had, she was 24, she was at MIT, she coined the word software engineering because she's like, there's all these other engineers, so I'm gonna be a software engineer. Uh, and she, she had her daughter. And her daughter was playing around in the lunar lander capsule that was the mock-up they had. And she flipped some switches in the wrong way. And Margaret realized that the astronauts could be coming down and the switches could be wrong. And so what she did was she created many different things. But one of them was a display so you could see what was going on called a priority display. So work on inventing, co-inventing what was asynchronous software and that. And so literally four minutes before we landed on the moon, switches were in the wrong places. Should we abort or not? Are we going to kill these people? What's going to happen? What do you think? What should we do? Guess what? We got some priority displays we could look at. And we look at them, we're like, oh, it's not true. And it turned out that the astronauts hadn't made a mistake, but actually the, the uh, manual had just had a mistake wow. in it. Wow. And so we landed on the moon. And that's an incredible thing to know. And that, you know, a 24-year-old young woman did that work that would not have happened. And she had to argue like crazy, which there's been some themes about style compliance and the rules and what's, you know, you have to fit in all these other spaces instead of being yourself. And so Margaret had to argue really hard for that, that to be in there. Because people are like, oh, no, the astronauts won't get it wrong. <laughs> you know, no one will get it wrong. And so she was able to successfully make that happen, wow. and we landed on the moon. And we all know from the movie about, you know, the, the, the women computers, colored women computers. And so there were, you know, many women who um, were uh, worked along with Dr. Katherine Johnson. And the movie talks about Dr. Katherine Johnson, about um, um, uh, Mary Jackson, 
and uh, Dorothy about Vaughan. Dorothy Vaughn. And Dorothy Vaughn's daughter is still alive and has some amazing stories to tell as well. So we want to definitely give credit, credence, and, and shout out to all of these women. But one of the other things that I asked Catherine was, how were you able to do this? I mean, it was the 60s, segregation, bombings, lynching, everything. How were you able to walk into the NASA environment in that sort of marginalized culture and knowing at the end of the night you had to walk out into a society that was life-threatening in itself. How were you able to even just focus to do something that required such pre precision that had never been done before? And she said, we couldn't be distracted by those things. We were too busy trying to get human on the moon. It's like, wow, that's a solution. Let your moonshot be something greater than yourself and a lot of that noise, voices, they just become just that noise. That's really powerful. Megan, one of the things I love that you talk about is how, and when, you, when you talk about hidden figures, can you talk about how you, where you put Ida B. Wells? She, so uh, if you don't know Ida, Ida B. Wells is just an extraordinary American um, who uh, I think of her as a data scientist because she used data that she was able to look through all of the news reports and all those things. She's known mostly as a journalist, but she's really a data science journalist, a combination of the two. And a lot of times, women are working in much more intersectional spaces. And it's a place where we have to take our position. You don't have to do all these clean cut things. The universe doesn't separate the subjects by bells, you know, that we, we do in school, so you can put them together. So uh, she used that to really, and, and we just saw the, the museum open, but to look at the data of what was really happening around lynching. And she really used that data to get us to, called, called the red record, and really stopped Americans from lynching at the scale that was going on, and really changed minds with the data. And people came to believe what, what she showed us. So I, as a, his, a historian by background, you know, studied Ida B. Wells, loved her, but I hadn't put that context together of Ida as a data scientist. I and I just, I found that um, uh, just incredible way to frame it and way to think about, you know, people we may somewhat know but don't even necessarily put into context their contribution. Mm -hmm. And so would love to kind of pivot <laughs> off of that to talk about, you know, what we're talking about backstage, right? Both of you are hidden figures yourselves. And, you know, you weren't always as well known in your career. And even in the echelons you're in now, you know, what is what are the things you, you still bump <coughs> up against? And what was that journey like in, in um, being hidden, very accomplished women in tech. And I'll let you start on this one. Well, I think um, there's a lot of rules, and you're fitting into the rules. I think one of the things about passion really helps. Actually, I'm going to cough, so I'm going to make you do I'm going to get some water. You go. Oh, OK. So wow. <laughs> um, you know, um, being a hidden figure, it's, it's part of the conversation. It's, it's, it's always there. It doesn't <laughs> go away. And every time you walk in the room, it, it always struck me, no matter how accomplished I've been throughout my trajectory, I still start at that bottom rung, having to explain, defend, demonstrate. And it's not even the, the new room. It can be a room that I've occupied, you know, a position that I've been in longer than other colleagues around me. But if I get a new supervisor, all of a sudden it's like the first day on the job and I have to prove myself all over again. So I realized that there's a lot of energy that gets sucked away from having to do that repetitively. And I decided to harness that energy and apply it where I wanted to. And what I realized is I may not be able to change the conversation, but I can change what I choose to listen to. Mm -hmm. And the most difficult voice to manage is a voice in your own head. As a matter of fact, it's a full-time job, 24-7, so much so that it's a blessing, because there's really no room for any of the other um, <laughs> disparaging and naysayers <laughs> and everything like that. Um, it's been tough, and you really have to you know, pull up uh, your bootstraps and believe in yourself. And it's hard when you're in a place where you may be the only one or one of few, and there's no reflection, and there's no echo, and one wonders why as I aspire to the vacuum of space, because it feels like <laughs> I'm returning. It feels I get that. Um, but it's wonderful when you do hear another voice, or you can look out and see the reflection of who you are in the eyes of the other, mm. of, of others. And that's why 
that's what keeps me going every day, is even if I can't hear my own voice inside my head or it's drowned out by the words and the looks of others, that I can still look out and see the next generation or see my peers or see my role models, um, folks that I have used, my ancestors, where I can see myself, my identity. So when I can't see it, we need to have representation so that we can still get a view on what is otherwise hidden to the world. Yeah, I think it's really important. There's um, people really, um, it's a friend of mine, Kate, Katie Coleman, who you know, uh, astronaut, um, she was talking a little bit, and Mate, also Mate Jevonson. When you stand on the side of the pool when you're about to do uh, some of the different training exercises, because there's a mock-up of the shuttle payload bay, they say, you know, a lot of times if a guy stands up there, like, I wonder what he's doing today. And if a woman stands up there, they'll be like, I wonder, I wonder if she can do this. You know, and, it, and there's just a lot to overcome all around you. And, and it's every day and it's constant. And so you guys already are experiencing that, whether you're aware of it or not. Uh, you're experiencing it, and then sometimes you're super aware of it, right? It's both of those things are happening all the time. And so, you know, there's this group of folks who, you know, every film, everything, everything's about them. And then Gina Davis, who does such amazing research around uh, media, says, you know, boys would be boys and girls would be boys. <laughs> you know, so when we watch this, so we, I don't know, we used to play Star Trek when I was a kid, and I was with Scotty, you know, because I don't want to be an engineer. Um, so... It, you know, that's very real, and it, it's hard. And in the White House, uh, a lot of our colleagues, before we got there, they actually, the women learned to repeat each other so that they could get it, it themselves heard. And there's some data we're going to show you in a sec that, that will show sort of some of why we're programming. Actually, this is really useful. So this is film when we watch TV. So the small lines down below, the blue is men's lines or boys' lines to women's or girls' lines in children's TV. So the blue is men. So look at that down there, so in the bottom. Uh, and then when we grow up, because we grew up with that kind of children's television, up on the top, that's men's lines to women's lines in 2,000 films. Gosh. Isn't that astonishing? And none of us really know that, but we feel this. This is every meeting we're in. It's, it's the textbook you're reading. It's the, the films. It's, it's all around us. And up on the right, it shows as men get older, they get more lines in blue. And as women get older, they get less lines. And so it's very hard to be heard in a, in a sort of the propaganda of media that's around us that then sets the tone for all other places. And so it's really important. The good news is we're starting to shift that, and we all have to work really hard together, men and women, because none of us created this media environment, but we inherit it together. And it's really debilitating, and it really hurts our societies in ways. And it also hurts our companies and our products and organizations as well as individuals. Now, you've got a good good thing going on, which is... Oh, yeah, well, to... This to, is exciting. I know, to parley off of what you were saying, Megan, um, when I was a kid, Star Trek, um, everybody wanted to be uh, Barbie, and I wanted to be Bones. And that just, there was no conversation space with that at all. But, <laughs> but, but today, it's changed, and these uh, young ladies out here of all ages, um, they get to um, be a cartoon character that might look a little more reflective of them because on Monday, this Monday, May 7th, 5.30 p.m. Pacific time, 3.30 p.m. Central time, and what would that be? Oh, yeah, sorry. 5.30 Pacific. 3.30 here? Is it 3.30 here? 3.30... Pacific? <laughs> We're in Pacific, Pacific, Megan. You're going to Texas. Uh, 3.30 in, all right, 5.30 in California. Do the math. Uh, 3.30 in Texas, and then East Coast, that would be, what, 1.30. Yeah. Disney Junior, not Disney, but Disney Junior Channel, there's a show called uh, Miles from Tomorrowland. It's about um, initially a family, and there's now these... Fan. Hey, there you go. Young people who are out there connecting the universe and saving... Well, this episode is a featurette, a feature where they're going to save the International Space Station that has four astronauts on it. And I get to be one of those cartoon, I am officially a cartoon character. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. That's awesome. I have come full circle. Many people have said I have always been a cartoon character, but now it's official and validated. And um, I'm one of the four astronauts. Um, there's actually two African-American females. 
I'm the one with the braided hair on the treadmill with the coolest lines. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, check it out and um, definitely. So what, what makes me really excited about that is that becomes an embodiment, um, a, a, a view, a visual of something that we can all build a converse, not just a conversation, but a culture around. So can we talk about the future a little bit? I think it's a great segue, right? So um, Megan, you said something really powerful that I'll restate and would love to hear you riff on, which is that you know, when we think about what Nicole Sanchez shared, right? Like let's envision a new future for tech. You said the future will be based on who we include. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about like the power when we are hidden figures no more, what does that mean for what is possible for tech and for STEM? Yeah. I think it's uh, incredibly exciting. I mean, we, when we came out of the White House, I made this company shift seven because I think we got to shift to seven billion people, seven oceans, seven continents. Like, how about now? And so if we include everyone. And so we've been doing a lot of work going all around the country, been across Appalachia and into Milwaukee and other places. We're, we're not, uh, we're in and uh, Birmingham and just finding people and helping people come into the tech world. And it doesn't mean that everybody has to do tech things, but just like we teach freshman biology or English class, we got to teach computation and coding and inventing. I always like bring this around. I'm like, we need our pink hat, pink hat. We also need pink lab glasses, right? So <laughs> let's like have all the tools of the universe that everybody is powerful with using them, and so not be afraid of them. And so I think that as we get better and better at doing that, people are going to do their thing. So I think it's, it's the hard work that we're doing around social change, uh, waking up to, uh, you know, the, you, the, you had a speaker yesterday who was doing work around um, code review. And Raquel just, Romano. Raquel Mar yeah. Romano. So uh, the compliance, there's one that I've heard of a, a tech crunch. For example, when they're doing the pitch competition, there's a researcher who's looked at which questions get asked to who. So lots of people get, you know, cat, how big is this? You know, and then you're like riffing about the future. And then Vaughn, uh, how are you going to hold on your market? You know, so these diminishing questions, and they've noticed that it's that the men and women are getting these. Now you can turn that around. You can answer the question and then go. But we have to start to practice at these culture changes. So I think that work, together with getting the skills to everybody, young people as well as you know, people are doing code boot camps and all kinds of stuff right now as grown-ups at all ages. You know, so training and the future of work and as AI comes, just getting everybody into the power tools of the future. And then what Catherine always said is you know teach your passion. But how about you do the thing you want to work on and bring those tools to this? So why is it that we think that tech is somehow for self-driving cars? Advertising, delivery of restaurant food, uh, you know, precision medicine, like really important, these are important good things. And you know, I said not to diminish those, but to say like those are things, those are cool. And what about poverty and justice and hunger and these topics? And why are we not using, and I'm headed to United States of Women shortly, um, which is all these organizations, and one of the things we've been talking about is plus TQ plus tech IQ, you know, and having tech people in your team who want to work tech stuff on that, right, uh, and those topics and sort of play the whole orchestra on all the hard problems and field the whole team. And can you imagine, I think, if we include everyone, we'll basically fix everything or nearly everything. I love that. Yeah. And I think, uh, Megan, you touched on it beautifully. If you look out in nature and the, and, and the natural world and everything, there aren't these silos. There aren't these tabs. You can really do whatever you want and apply tech as a tool to be able to be an enabler. So we need to get rid of the classroom that has walls and ceilings and realize that the universe, the world, this planet, and even off, the multiverse, is really our classroom. And let's pull it all in. There's no borders. There's no division, anything like that. And I think that's really important to teach that kind of logical, imaginative, wonder, discovery sense that isn't siloed and doesn't have kind of stereotypical ways of learning thing. And that means everybody has access to learning. And the good news is that if you look around, we started doing something called Scout and Scale that is thinking, you know, the venture capitalists here aren't making these companies. They're finding great entrepreneurs and supporting them. It's very biased right now because 90% goes to men, 1% to African-American founders, and 75% uh, of venture goes to this area, New York and uh, Boston. Mm -hmm. So I'm just about to go with Steve Case on Rise of the Rest next week. He's got a bus. We're going through the south, uh, starting in Dallas and then on up. Um, I'm just going to a couple of the days. But you know, there's lots of entrepreneurs, but we can't have Ohio get 
you know, in a year what Silicon Valley gets in a week because entrepreneurs in Ohio can't lift and we can't have it by gender race. So, but the good news is people are working on this stuff. Yeah. And whether it's the stuff you were just talking about with young people, there are some great schools. So the same idea of Scout and Scale, can you find people who already have that thing and kind of almost venture catalyze them? help those people scale those ideas out into the world, like the XQ super school movements. Or one of my favorite STEM interventions is the chief science officers of Arizona. These are elected children your age. So you guys could bring chief science officer to the school president and the treasurer. You know, the kids can do it. And there's almost 500 of them now in the country. So there's stuff that works that we should rapidly share. One of the things that, so we actually have more, more time than, than, than that. Um, one of the things that I, um, I think would be cool to hear um, from both of you is some of these um, tales from the trenches, and then we'll open it up for questions. But Megan, I'm always inspired when you talk about, you know, who's the executive at YouTube who was in labor and closed Susan, the deal. Just... And then there was another one while well, she was on bed rest who designed a really important component of technology. And just kind of talk through some of these stories that we don't always hear or know about our contributions. Yeah, I, and I, I think not only the Exactly as you're saying, like the, this extraordinary thing that the person has done, but also the context that we're all in of balancing our crazy lives, just like the guys are, uh, you know, that, that uh, they, these people are doing that too, and some of the truth of that. So Susan Wojcicki, for example, is my incredible colleague at Google Forever. The company was started in her garage, uh, and uh, she is an amazing executive, led AdWords and all kinds of things, um, now is the head of YouTube. And so just... You know the, the movie that was made about the hack? What's it called? The interview, right? Yeah. Um, that she was able to get that on YouTube. Remember during that holiday? It was a year or two years ago, three yeah, years ago. Uh, she was able to cut the deal, and she was going into labor with her fifth child. So, you know, there's like crazy stuff that happens when people do things, you know. So it's, it's exciting to think about how people are. My friend Anna Patterson is one of the greatest, you know, AI leaders around. And one time... Um, Let's see, when she was on bed rest, have you ever gone to archive.org? If you go to archive.org, you can see the Wayback Machine, and there's a search box there, and you put in a search for yahoo.com or something, and up comes not the site, but all these dates. And then you can click on 19, or 2004, and you can see what Yahoo looked like in that day. You can click around and look at the internet. So they've stay, saved, and she wrote the search across that while she was on bed rest. Uh, she's an extraordinary heroic engineer. She's the vice president of Google. Now she's spun out and doing AI incubator. Um, but you know she has four children. Like people live their lives and do these things. And so you should know it's possible. It's still you know crazy and and how life is, but it's possible. And people have done that. Megan, did you bring your timeline? Yeah, uh, yeah I have uh, this <laughs> one. This, yeah. So one of the things. Actually, I'm going to show you. Can we show them uh, the picture yes. of Ada? This is one of the. This is one of the hidden figures that um, is one of our founders. So this is really the first person, the first human in the world to think of the idea of algorithms. And her name is Ada Lovelace. Uh, some people, how many people ever heard of her? Some people have, yeah. So we're starting to get her in there. And when we did this Google Doodle, we had her rising worldwide for 200 million people saw that. And they, she was rising for 20 hours worldwide in the top 10 of Twitter. You know, this woman from the Victorian age. So in 1842, she translated this paper, and she added a section, because women really couldn't, like Darwin wrote his Origin of the Species. She couldn't write, here's the fundamental paper of computer science, because women weren't able to do that. But she was able to add some notes. Uh, and so she translated this. She was working with Charles Babbage, who made the first mechanical computer, it's her collaborator. 20 pages of translation, and then 55 pages <laughs> of notes. That was clever. Which is the fundamental paper for computer science. <laughs> uh, and she signed it AAL because, like J.K. Rowling and other people, you have to not mention your woman if you want to be sold, a, 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 you know, according to some people. And uh, so that's this is her extraordinary work. I I just I want to celebrate her and also show you this because look at her hair, <laughs> and it's May the Fourth be with you day, so it's pretty fun. <laughs> but but it's it's worth noting, you know, if you grab hold of this, this is a, a document that's called the Timeline of Mathematics. And somebody had the idea that there should be no women written in the entire thing. 
Now, there are some under the culture part of it, so Maria Montessori's down here, but there are literally no women, and you can go, and I know stories about all these people, like here is uh, Babbage's engine is right there, and Ada's not here. But I think Babbage's engine, but by arguably, I think computer science is as important as the hardware, right? But it isn't until computer science starts to become something guys are doing is that it becomes important. Right, and you can see in this particular, there's a couple of the same series, all the pictures of Grace Hopper and Ada. Grace invented coding languages, and for Grace, she, um, she felt that you could broaden participation if you could write in an English-like language, and everybody thought that was a dumb idea. And so she wrote this compiler, a translator, uh, to translate, and so she invents what becomes the first computer languages, uh, which leads to COBOL, and so, of course she was right. And actually, one piece of advice, a friend of mine saw her in the airport once. Uh, she's not alive anymore. But she said, don't let them tell you you're wrong if you're not. <laughs> right? And it's a great quote. So I think that this sort of what you see in the world and what you are passionate about, you got to do. And you got to work against all this stuff. Yeah. Because we're telling you that there's lots of women in every single story here. You know, whether it's Alan Turing and the code breakers of Bletchley Park, uh, two-thirds women, they saved 11 million lives in shortened World War II by two years with heroic engineering and mathematical computation. Two-thirds women, including the Duchess of Cambridge's uh, great aunt and grandmother. And yet the so. film centered on men. Yeah. 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 So the men are doing it too, but they're not alone. <laughs> so um, right before we, we um, take a few questions, Dr. Cagle, I'd love to close with you just talking about the, um, that powerful story from Dr. K, uh, from uh, Kathleen Johnson, and what your aha moment was when when you were talking with her, and what that perspective that you took away from that. Well, um, um, so Dr. Kathleen Johnson, we've had I don't know upwards of 15, 20 conversations. I actually flew her for the Oscars from Virginia all the way to California. So that she whole means flew the plane. Yes, no, I wish. It was like, yeah. <laughs> Actually, Catherine got up and walked for the first time in like almost two years because I, and she wanted, she was heading to the cockpit. I was like, she's going to try to fly this plane. Uh, <laughs> but um, it was really great. So I flew her to the Oscars. And uh, so she had said to me, um, I, that I said, what's the most important thing that we can say? to bring our next generation to have young girls of all ages, you know, moms after they're, they're uh, raising their children. How can we have women fall in love with STEM, STEAMs, or uh, like I like to say, teams, technology, engineering, art, math, and science? So I said, how do we, how do we change that conversation where we feel strong and confident and want to not just engage, but to embrace? And a, a quick aside, you know, when we have the imposter syndrome, when we try to step out outside of our comfort zone. But for men, they don't call it the imposter syndrome, but they have the same thing. You know what they call it for men? Bravado. <laughs> it's the same thing, but it's a different context. So I was talking to Catherine, I said, you know, you're a teacher as well. How do you teach this? And she said, the most important thing, and every time we would have this conversation, she would say, teach your passion. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, all right, but you did the trajectory to space and everything like that. What's the math? What's the neuroscientist, neural networks that we have to do? How do we change DNA and recode our you know, all, uh, stem cells and everything? And she would say the same thing, teach your passion. I'm like, yeah, yeah, OK, yeah, passion, right, <laughs> teach your passion. Finally, and it was, I think, a week ago, it finally hit me. Megan got it in the room just before we came immediately. And it's not so much the passion part. We all know that. That's important. She said, teach your passion. Don't just teach. Don't just teach the facts. Don't just teach why you know, science, math, engineering, all those things are amazing and, and cr incredible and fun. But teach why you fell in love with it. Teach what your romance with those topics are. Teach that. And when you teach your engagement, your enchantment, your romance, it, everything just falls. Everyone wants to be a part of that conversation. And that I finally heard the your, teach your passion. So isn't that it, wonderful? It's amazing. And you know, it speaks to what technology in its greatest form is about love. Because there's two kinds of love, maybe three. One is you're curious. Like, you're just wonder. Wonder itself is about love and learning and something new. 
There's also love of service. Like you can help people with this technology. You can illuminate something like Ida did. She got us to stop doing something horrific, right? Uh, or you could solve a problem, right? You're working on bone density and all this amazing stuff for, you know, for our bodies and for solve Mars. problems for She's Mars. For working Mars. on Mars project um, right now. And also we can work together, love of community and teamwork, you know, and so you don't think of it and, and yeah. it's in its saddest form, you know, it's, it's when it's weaponized, you know, and people are in fear and so they're weaponizing it to attack, right? And so how do we stay in technology for love and protection and security? I love that, Megan. So what we're teaching is we're not teaching math. Don't teach math. Teach the language of love. Teach how it's a, a tool and a force to be reckoned with that can feed people and bring water to the world and come up with amazing technology that can improve our, our health, our environment, and our communities here. We are now going to take questions, so please raise your hand. Thanks again, Molly, for helping us here. Um, <laughs> my question is for Dr. Yvonne. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for your work. I thanked you yesterday, but a woman like you and Mae Jemison has inspired me throughout my life. Um, and it's not one specific thing, but the fact that you did many things is what inspired me. Um, like Mae Jemison, she wasn't just an astronaut, she was a dancer. She studied African American studies, chemical engineering, medicine, all of these things. Um, I feel like a lot of women well, just people in general, we're told to be specific when we can like have passions in many multidisciplinary realms. And that's a huge thing for me. Um, I was initially a mathematician um, with a computer science um, concentration. Can you hold the mic a little closer? Uh, yeah, with a computer science concentration, but got bored and did chemistry. I really love tech. Um, and I'm also an entrepreneur with side projects. Um, and I want to make sure I keep up the passion and not get discouraged as I'm moving upwards in my career. Um, so my question is, how can someone like me get you to be my mentor in a sense? <laughs> how can someone like her get me to be her mentor? Oh my gosh, this is great. <laughs> Wow, wow. Um, I think uh, mentoring goes both ways. And so I'm going to turn that back around and say, uh, you just said some amazing things about what you're aspiring to, what you're achieving to, and everything. So my response to that is, how can I get you to be my mentor? <laughs> Um, the best way to get me to be your mentor is to do exactly what you're doing. Um, show up, stand up, step up, because it inspires me and it keeps me in the game pushing and wanting to be that kind of wonder woman that you described so beautifully to live up to that. Thank you. you know, one of the things that I really appreciate about how you were just talking about your interest in this and sort of May and Ivana, the way that you guys, the way that we're all much more intersectional, that we're much more interested in all kinds of things, right? Yes. You know, people are going to live 100 years. I mean, Catherine's already 99, right? So, you know, people are going to live a long time. It'd be really boring if you just did one thing, right? And so be really proud and, you know, mindful about, you know, pushing, uh, breaking down the walls between the subjects. And it's often in the intersection of people and things and topics that some of the greatest answers and opportunities and fun are. Uh, you know, flying around and doing science and probably reading some history about Bessie Coleman and these other people, and Mary Earhart, all these people, like all of that goes together, right? right? And so be, be mindful to like try to get rid of all those boundaries. We have like two more minutes to take questions, then we're gonna have Caitlin Hova come up. Yes, ma'am. My name is Kishani from Black Girls Brilliant, and um, I just wanna know like, what inspires you to have so much confidence to chase your dreams? Wow, what inspired me to have so much confidence? That's, that's directed to both of us. Uh, so much confidence. Um, just seeing folks like you take the mic, stand up, and you know, voice. Um, the, the best thing that gave me the confidence, and it's even recent, because 
you know, Megan and I have talked to other amazing women and all, always, before we take the stage or whatever, we're always kind of self-talking, trying to self-manage that, that imposter voice or am I good enough or why am I on stage and not any of these other more amazing people and all of that, to know that even now at our level, we still kind of second guess and question that. Mm -hmm. And so it's important to find your voice. And when I hear my voice, I really connect to it. And for the cartoon character, the most exciting thing when they premiered it at Johnson Space Center over the weekend was to hear my voice. I have never heard my voice outside of my own head. And it was, <laughs> it was, it was, it wasn't screechy, you know, that, and that's been reflected by many of my colleagues that I always feel like I'm coming across screechy. It was great, it was strong, it was empowering, and, and I think it's important that we find our voice. And if we can't find our voice, let's be the voice for each other. Yeah. And if you notice, even on stage here, I forgot to talk about biochemistry and being a doctor and flying and all those other things. Um, Megan forgot to talk about Google and the White House and everything. We don't introduce <laughs> ourselves well. It doesn't, but we introduce each other very well. You did a great job introducing and making call outs. So find your voice ride that voice and be the voice for the other, not just to say how awesome we all are, but also to call out people who are marginalizing us and make it be known, heard, and that it won't be tolerated. That's right. Woo. I think that's a really, yeah, amazing. <laughs> the point about teamwork, you know, if you're struggling talking about yourself, someone can talk about you and you can talk about them. You know, there's, there's really uh, good things to do. I mean, who said that like, who made up all these crazy rules? Like, one of them, don't cry at work. Like, who thought of that? That's dumb. <laughs> <laughs> like, if you're crying, you care about something, right? So you know, there's a lot of rules around that may, don't make sense. And so we can be in, in teamwork with each other. Um, I've been doing a bunch of work in a, this movement called Time's Up which the actresses really came together to create. And a lot of the really most famous actresses that we know, you know, a lot of times they can be the only one on set. Natalie Portman, uh, who actually played uh, in the Star, Star Wars, uh, um, Luke and Leia, she played Luke and Leia's mother, right? So um, she uh, talks, talked about, like, you're on set and you're kind of disintermediated because you're the, one of the only women in the leadership stuff because of this media bias. And so what's nice is now they have a community of maybe 100 or 200 actresses who are friends now. And, and they're really helping each other. And so change the system. And change the system. Change the system how you want it to be because the system got designed by people and then it got out of control. That's and right. systems are kind or cruel depending on who you are. So let's get rid of the cruel, let's keep the kind, and let's include everyone in that kind of, that part of the system. Can we give them both a round of applause? Oh, sure. I, I have to tell you that the, the only reason this conversation took place, the only reason this conversation took place is because they both were so excited about um, Tech Supermoon and what it stands for that they moved heaven and earth to be able to be here with us. So I, I can't tell you how much we appreciate having both of you on stage for the community, and we just thank you. And, and Mars, we, too. And <laughs> Mars, yeah, and we appreciate Kat Absolutely. and the team here who've put all this together, because being in community is an essential part to making change. It's through the confidence and the knowledge and, and the action that we're gonna do together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.